Good evening. Good to see you out this Wednesday evening, uh, September the 15th, halfway through the month of September, and uh, the days keep marching on. Uh, I'm hopeful one day they stop marching on because of the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is my prayer that he returns soon and very soon, um, and that those that uh, have the opportunity will accept him as Lord and Savior in the meantime. Tonight, I wanted to uh, start our service off by uh, reading to you from Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. If you go back and look at Acts chapter 5, it's actually a pretty action-packed chapter on what takes place with the apostles. And as the chapter ends, they are in front of the council uh, and folks are discussing their future toward the very end, just before verse 42. Um, the apostles are beaten for their belief in Jesus Christ and in representing him. And they were beaten and said, go and no longer speak in the name of Jesus. And they just let them go. Uh, but as scripture would have it continue to tell us this particular narrative, it says in verse 42... Um, they departed, or verse 41, I'll back up, they departed in the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. And I want to encourage you uh, daily as you go about your business that you don't pause and you don't uh, hide the fact and that you don't uh, be ashamed of the fact of Christ, but instead that you do not cease teaching and sharing your testimony uh, with others that you come in contact with in the good name of Christ. And part of that is by telling the story of Jesus. So let's stand together this evening and let's start our service off by doing just that, telling the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God. triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart. Precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. For love in that story so tell. Tell me the story. 
Father, we do thank you for today, and we thank you again for another opportunity to live for you, to be a shining example to you, uh, for those that we come in contact with, for those that we have influence over, for those that we care about and love about, for those people we visit with, for those people we just uh, have a, uh, an encounter with at the grocery store, or the gas station, wherever. Father, uh, I pray that you would let us continually shine your light as long as you give us breath. Father, I'm encouraged at the end of this hymn that we just sang, uh, where it says, uh, Stay and let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Father, what good news is found in the last part of that as we've sung about the story of Jesus and what he's done for us and how he died on the cross and shed his precious blood for our sin so that we could be found forgiven for those of us that have accepted you as Lord and Savior. So tonight, Father, I pray that we would find encouragement and hope that your love for us paid our ransom, paid our debt. What good, good news that is. So, Father, tonight as we open your word, may we be reminded of the things that you have done for us and the things that you have done in your life and your ministry on this earth to set an example for us so that we can draw closer to you and in turn help others see you reflected in our life. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Derek. I don't know if y'all noticed, but he did find a hymn in the hymn book with the word fasting in it. Fasting alone in the desert. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew chapter 9 is where we'll start tonight. And uh, again, this is a topic that came through the mailbag. And again, if there's any uh, topic that you would like to discuss, questions about the Bible, about the Lord, um, email or snail mail or send them to me one way or the other and we'll try to address them um, as we study through the word of God together uh, again tonight the topic will be fasting uh, with the long list of troubles that we see in our daily news it seems like our nation and world need the kind of healing that only God can give uh, in Matthew 17 we read how Jesus cast a demon out of a boy um, that the disciples had not been able to heal. And they were wondering why in Matthew 17, 17, Jesus says, this kind of healing does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so one of our viewers has suggested that we should pray and fast for the revival in our nation, which as we have talked before, uh, seems to be something only God could do. So fasting is a biblical principle uh, that's been practiced by saints in both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, but as we said in our workup for question of the evening, it doesn't seem to be considered very important discipline for modern times. It seems like uh, the churches know more about feasting than they do fasting. But during this study, we wanted to look at the spiritual discipline called fasting. And of course, our question for the evening was, how often do we fast? And 4% said they fast often. 14% said they fast sometimes. 28% said seldom and 54% said never. So we're gonna be talking about that tonight. So hopefully you got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter nine. And if you read this passage of scripture, apparently Jesus thought we should and that we would fast. Uh, chapter nine, verse 14. When the disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. It says, then they will fast. Do we? Well, not according to our statistics, but we're going to look at it tonight. So what is fasting? Of course, fasting in its basic form means to abstain from food. Um, uh, the spiritual discipline of fasting is a little more complicated than that. That's where you abstain from something in the physical so that you can experience something in the spiritual. In other words, you lay aside your bread so that you can take part in the daily bread uh, where you share in the word of God and allow the Lord to speak to you through that. 
I'm sure we've all fasted some, but not always for spiritual reasons. Uh, usually uh, what we have is called diets, where we fast in order to lose weight or to lower our cholesterol or to adjust blood sugar or something like that. Uh, if you've been in a hospital for tests before, you've probably seen the little sign that says NPO, uh, which uh, is Latin for nil per os, uh, which means nothing by mouth, and it's usually, what, after midnight, so you get all purged for a medical test the next day. Uh, how many of you sleep? Well, when you sleep, you're actually fasting. You're not eating while you... And that's why it's called breakfast. Did you know that? You're breaking the fast, so that's... I don't charge you a thing for that. Y'all can hold on to that one. So again, we've all fasted, but not always for spiritual reasons. Uh, the Bible mentions that there are several kind of fasts for uh, spiritual reasons. There's the normal fast, which is to go without food like Jesus did. In Matthew 4, 2, it said he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Then there's something called a partial fast where you abstain from certain foods. We see an example of that in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 12, where uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all only ate vegetables and water because they would not defile themselves with the king's meat, nor would they drink the king's wine. And then we have something called an absolute fast, and that's where you fast from both food and drink. Uh, like Paul the Apostle in Acts 9.9 9, said he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Uh, Old Testament book of Esther, chapter 4 and verse 16, uh, where she was fixing to have to go in to the, before the king to try to appeal for the Jewish people. And of course, they had that rule where if you went before the king and he didn't ask you to be in there, he could point you and they'd take you out and kill you. So she said, I've got to go in there. So she was asking the nation of Israel to pray for her. So she says, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, day or night. So that was what we, you would call an absolute fast where you didn't eat or drink. Um, and of course, we usually think of fast as doing without food, but it can also expand beyond that. And uh, the story of uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem, if you remember Luke chapter two, there was a woman named Anna and it says that she often fasted and uh, she did it day and night so she also included without sleep or without rest uh, 1 Corinthians 7 5 includes uh, uh, without sex uh, also uh, throughout the Bible it mentions uh, fasting without comfortable clothes where you actually wore sackcloth and ashes you've heard, probably heard that expression before so Old Testament saints fasted, uh, all Israel did on the Day of Atonement, which we read about in Leviticus 16, 29. The whole nation was supposed to fast on the Day of Atonement. And of course, the list of people who fasted uh, is like a who's who of the faithful. You got Moses and David and Elijah and Esther and David, I, I mean Daniel and Ezekiel, Nehemiah and several others. We read where they fasted in Old Testament times. Jesus, of course, fasted. He went without food for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. But he didn't require his disciples to fast. Why? Because he said, I'm the bridegroom, and when the bridegroom's with them, they need to celebrate. They don't need to fast. But he said, I'll be going away, and then they will fast. But he instructed them on how to fast. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, it says, When you fast, notice it didn't say if you fast. It said when you fast, uh, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And isn't that a real kick? If you go to the trouble to fast, you don't get to brag about it. Well, that's another spiritual discipline called secrecy. You're not supposed to let the left hand know what the right hand does with your arm. So when you, what fun is there to say, I fasted three days and not be able to say it. But anyhow, you know, that's what the Pharisees did do. Remember Luke chapter 8, verse 12. Uh, the Pharisee was sitting there boasting about how wonderful he was. He was unlike that tax collector standing over there trying to worship the Lord. Remember he said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. You know, I'm a good, he was bragging on himself. Jesus said, don't do that. So uh, fasting was practiced by the early church. In Acts uh, chapter 13, it says the church at Antioch, they ministered before the Lord and they fasted. 
It was practiced after New Testament times. There was an early church a book called the Didache, which actually means the teaching of the apostles, uh, and they recommended fasting every Wednesday and Friday. Why that Wednesday and Friday? They said because the Jews fast on Monday and Thursday. So I, re <laughs> so I reckon they didn't want to confuse themselves with a Jewish fast. Uh, but strange thing, though, you know, Satan really doesn't want Christians to fast or to pray or to serve because the more we become like Christ, the more spiritually powerful you become, and Satan doesn't want that. So Satan does things with all the spiritual disciplines in order to give them a bad reputation. And fasting is no different than that. Uh, if you'll remember, Roman Catholicism kind of took control of the European church after the times of the apostles, and fasting was really taken to the extremes uh, by the monks in the monastic orders. Uh, they went from fasting in order to grow spiritually to fasting as a competitive sport. Uh, they actually had competitions on who was the best faster. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one was an uh, Irish monk named uh, Ciaran uh, who lived around 500 A.D. They said he fasted often, and when he did uh, break the fast, he would uh, mix sand in his bread just to show how difficult by the way, if you want to study this, you look it up under um, asceticism, which is uh, you know extreme uh, self-discipline in order to try to prove how holy you were. So again, there was a lot of that went on in the early church uh, following the times of the apostles. There was another monk named uh, Mercurius of Alexandria, 4th century. He ate no cooked food for seven years. So I guess he could eat something like an apple, but if it had been cooked, then he wouldn't eat it. Then there was an Irish monk named St. Kevin, uh, 5th century, supposedly stood up for seven years. Does that sound like fun? Um, and then there was an Italian Benedictine monk named Damien, 11th century, who died of starvation. He fasted so much he starved. But he also practiced self-flagellation. You've probably seen folks take the whips and they'd whip themselves. So don't know where he got that in the Bible, but anyhow, that was his thing. But I think the winner by far was a guy named Simeon Stilates. He was a 4th century monk, Asia Minor. He lived 30 years on a rock perch in the Syrian desert, 60 feet high, 3 feet wide. So there was this rock formation out there, 60 feet high, and at the top it was only three feet around. He had to tie himself in to keep from rolling off when he was asleep. He endured sun, rain, cold, uh, worms on his sores. Occasionally, his disciples uh, would take him up some food. So as you can see, is that extreme? I, I don't think there's any fasting in the Bible that calls for any kind of that, but there, that's what happens though. And then it kind of uh, throws a, a dispersion on the whole idea of fasting when you got guys doing crazy things like that. Over time, also, fasting became attached to forgiveness. Uh, Roman Catholics called it penance. So that's the way you would pay for your sins, is you would fast for so many days in order to pay for whatever sin it was that you wouldn't confess to the priest. So with all these abuses and excesses, by the time you get to the Reformation in like 1500, most Protestants had stopped fasting altogether. Uh, John Wesley uh, writes, Some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason, Others have utterly disregarded it. In other words, what fasting was going on by the time you got to 1500 is people were doing extreme crazy things, and then other people just weren't fasting at all. It is interesting to note, though, that all the great reformers who came out of that period of time and the revivalists like Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, all those folks practiced fasting. So regardless of the abuses and extremes and bad reputation that Satan has tried to give to it, fasting is still biblical. It's still a spiritual discipline. And if used properly, it'll help you grow in godliness. It'll help you grow in your relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, the Catholics were not the first to abuse fasting. If you have your Bible still open, and I hope you do, turn to Isaiah chapter 58, and we'll see a selection from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 58 in verse 1, Isaiah speaking on behalf of the Lord 
It says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob of their sins. Yet they seek me daily, they say. In other words, they, they go to the, still to go to their worship services. They seek me daily. They delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God, they say. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? And then the Lord speaks to them. In fact, in the, way, the day of your fast you find pleasure. You still exploit all your labors. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. In other words, see who can fast the biggest, the best. To strike with a fist of wickedness. In other words, while you're fasting, you end up fighting with one another. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? In other words, God said, did I ask you to fast like that? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call that a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? It's not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring into your house the poor who is cast out. And when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spread forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you read that passage, you'll notice the benefit of fasting all depends on the desire of your heart. What's going on in your heart while you're participating in this spiritual discipline called fasting? Are you fasting to brag on your own personal holiness? Are you fasting in order to get recognized by men that you fasted longer than everybody else in the church? Or are you trying to manipulate God? You see that in verse 3. They said, look, we fasted, and you ain't done nothing better for us, so why should we fast? Uh, so if you do all these things, fasting actually becomes a sin before God here is what Isaiah is saying. Had these folks competing with each other about who could fast the longest, look the baddest, smell the baddest, uh, they complained and poor mouthed God singing the blues about we're fasting, but it ain't doing any good. And when the fasting was over, they went back to business as usual, fussing and fighting and cheating and mistreating each other, ignoring the poor and the sick. Verse 5, God says, that kind of fasting accomplishes nothing. It's a waste of time. And if fasting doesn't make you more like God and make you love your fellow man more, then fasting is not accomplishing its purpose is what the Lord is trying to tell these people here. So, what kind of fasting does improve your relationship with the Lord? Well, if you look back to verses 6 and 7 that I just read, the Lord tells us it's that voluntary poverty where you choose to become poor for a day of your own free will, and really that's what fasting and sackcloth and ashes is all about. Fasting is where you go without food, so you know what it's like to be hungry. A sackcloth is where you wear the clothes of the poor. Most of the poor in Isaiah's day didn't have but one set of clothes, and that was what was on their back. And mostly what they could afford was a, a certain kind of goat hair garment that's very similar to what we would call burlap today. How many of y'all would like to wear burlap every day? Well, anyhow, that's what the average poor person wore. And he said, you know, you wear your sackcloth, it'll help you realize what these poor people are living with. Dust and ashes... That's to make you sympathize with the beggars who are out there who sit out on the sidewalks begging because there wasn't any work for them or else they weren't able to work. And so they're out there where the ladies broomed their house out with the dust and ashes and stuff out there on the street. That's where the beggars sit. So what you're doing is you're making yourself as low as you can possibly be so you can relate to your brothers and sisters who are going through a hard time. Well, what good does fasting, what good does this self-inflicted poverty do? Well... Only someone who's been poor can fully appreciate riches. Do you realize that? Have you ever seen somebody that never really was poor, and no matter what you did, it wasn't good enough for them? But you bring in somebody who's actually been poor, and you give them something, guess what? They feel like they're kings now. So it's all a relative matter of where you are in the food chain. And so what you do is what you make yourself poor. It makes you appreciate the fact that you have some riches. If you're born rich, like most Americans, and I'm not talking about billionaires here, I'm talking about if you're a middle-class American, you're living better than most of the people in the world. Yeah. You, we, we don't really know how to relate to poor folks 
unless you do fast, unless you do take it, come down off your high horse and sit in your sackcloth and ashes for a few days. Uh, we, we begin to, even as middle class Americans, to assume that we deserve this lifestyle. We start to take our riches for granted and think we deserve more. But in verse 6, fasting, what it, does it do? It looses or breaks the bonds of our wicked, sinful nature. All of us are born with a self-centered, sinful nature. If you don't believe it, go down and keep the nursery. You'll find out pretty quick, most of our babies are selfish. They want what I want when I want it. If we're not careful, we do the same things. Uh, and we have a short memory. Uh, we're thankful right now, but tomorrow we'll be saying, what have you done for me lately? And so that's why we have to go back and do this fasting thing to put ourselves back in a position of poverty voluntarily so that we learn how to praise the Lord for what he does give us. Remember the Adam and Eve story. God gave them a perfect environment. Here they were sitting in a paradise called the Garden of Eden. And instead of being thankful and grateful for all they did have, what did they do? They quickly got bored and became obsessed with what they did not have. And what were they not allowed to have? One tree. Out of all the trees in the garden, there was one tree. But for whatever reason, they had inquiring minds. They just couldn't let that go. So they forgot about God's blessing, forgot about his commandment, and that became the original sin. And we love to blame Adam and Eve for that, but you know, you and I are made out of the same stuff. We don't know how to be thankful. For most of us, we're like the old Joni Mitchell rock and roll song, I think it's called The Big Yellow Taxi. You remember there's a line in there. It says, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. And that's where most of us are. We don't appreciate health until we're sick. We don't appreciate our job until we're unemployed. We don't appreciate our children until the nest is empty. And we don't appreciate our life until it's time for us to die. And that's why we need to fast. That's why we need to voluntarily become poor for a day to cut those ties, to cut those uh, bonds of self-centered existence. We need to fast to gain some perspective of what could have been if we hadn't put our faith and trust in God and he chose to bless us. How quickly we forget that. We need to learn an attitude of gratitude for the Lord um, uh, who is the fount of every blessing. And once we deny ourselves uh, idols of this world, verse 9 says it will restore our relationship with God who created us. Now let me pause here and say that if you're not used to fasting, I don't recommend that you start like Moses and Jesus with 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, what we're talking about here is let's just start with one meal. If you hadn't ever done it before, just skip a meal today for the sole purpose of getting out your Bible and meeting God. Uh, have a time of prayer, and instead of, uh, instead of eating something, uh, feed on the Word of God and work it from there. Um, and again, from there you can progress up to two meals, and then after that, three meals. That means you fasted the whole day then, and you can build up to that and see what the Lord will do in your life. There are several things that happen when you're fasting. First of all, is while you're fasting, you're going to think about food. How many of you knew that? Yeah. Uh, that'll be the easy part. You'll feel your stomach growling, crawling around inside your abdomen, trying to find food. Uh, and you may quickly discover what Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 3.19, and that is, for a lot of us, our God is our belly. Many people live for their belly. You don't think about it, but we live for the food and drink and all this kind of stuff, and we live for money so that we'll always have a steady supply of food and drink. I remember when the Soviet Union fell in 1991, I remember reading that during that transition from communism to some form of democracy or de democratic government, the Russians began to complain because, you know, they were going through some rough times during this transition. You know what they said? At least Stalin gave us potatoes. Think about that for a minute. They were saying, I'd rather have food than freedom. I'd rather have a communist dictator telling us to do everything in our life, but at least he'll provide us potatoes. That sounds like somebody whose God is their belly. And it's not just the Russians. I remember uh, President Clinton's political advisor, James Carville, uh, had a famous quote, it's the economy, stupid. Remember that? That was what, you know, they get off on all these weird tangents and about what they need to do in order to get the votes. He said, it's always about the economy because, you know, he knew one thing about the American people. We will vote our pocketbook. 
We may not always vote the Bible. We may not always vote God. We may not vote our, our principles. But when it comes down to tax breaks and freebies and things like that, we'll tend to do it. What does that mean? It means our God is our belly. And so fasting helps us learn what Jesus taught us in Matthew 4.4. 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if we don't occasionally fast, we'll find ourselves compromising our Christian convictions for a piece of bread. And not only does a few hours of starving help us realize how we need God, it also improves our gratitude on how the Lord has blessed us. I guarantee you after a little while of fasting and you go out to a restaurant, you won't be ashamed to bow your head and say, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. Sometimes we get a little ashamed when we're fat and happy but whenever we pull ourselves away from that and begin to say, you know what? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's where I get everything. Second, while you're fasting, think about clothing. We saw that in verse 5 over there. Isaiah 58, 5 spoke of sackcloth. We've already mentioned how for the poor in that day, they only had one rough garment. Stop and ask yourself, when is the last time that when you looked in your closet, there was nothing there? How many in here? Anybody in here? And do you use watching on lines? Raise your hands out there. Too. Anybody, has anybody out there ever been in a position where the only clothes you had was what you had on your back? And say, we don't know how to relate. We don't know how to relate to poor people. Probably a dozen sets of clothes and shoes in everybody's house. Thank you, Lord, for providing for things for us to wear. Number three, while you're fasting, think about housing. Uh, go outside your house and sit under a tree and close your eyes and pretend like your house is not there. Now, most people think I could never be homeless. But I remember when I was pastoring in South Georgia, every month a uh, men's group from uh, the church that I was at uh, used to go into Tifton. They had a, a rescue mission for people who were coming along um, I-75 there on, down on their luck, and they could stay at uh, Brother Charlie's rescue mission until... Uh, they were able to make some better arrangements to move on. And we'd go out there once a month and um, pray and sing and share the gospel with them. And, of course, we'd talk with them and get to hear their stories. You know what? I never met a person that planned to be there. Never met a one that said, I think I want to grow up and be homeless. It happens, but it happens to folks. We think it can't happen to us. Sure it can. When you're fasting, you're pretending like that's happening to you. What kind of position would I be in? As the old English preacher John Bradford used to say, there but for the grace of God go I. That could be me. And so I need to thank God for the ways he's blessed us. You ever thank God for electricity? Only when the power goes off? And you're like me and you walk through the house, you're still flipping the switches out of habit? because you're so used to it that we don't even think about it anymore? You ever thank God for heating and air conditioning? Yeah. Most of us, the way we do warm and cool is with our finger. We go to the thermostat, flip it back and forth. You know, it wasn't that many years ago that if it's too cold, you had to cut and split your own wood. And if it was too hot, it was too bad. <laughs> You know, th think, about how, think about how well we've got things now. Thank God for running water. I remember when I was in Army Infantry, sometimes we'd go to the field, woods, for two or three weeks at a shot, no shower. What bathing we did, what shaving we did was out of our helmet. You know, they got funny helmets now that are made out of plastic stuff, you know, and holes in them. So I don't know what they do for it now, but ours could catch water. And that was the closest thing. I mean, you would find yourself hallucinating for running water <laughs> after, two or after two or three weeks with no bath out there. Uh, so, but, you know, we take that for granted. You ever watch uh, HGTV House Hunters? I, I watch it every now and then. I ain't going to say anything, Laura. But anyway, <laughs> it, it just drives me crazy, though. I see people walk through these houses. Oh, I just can't live here. This kitchen is so outdated. These bedrooms are too small. There's only three bathrooms in this house. I just can't live without a jacuzzi. You know, they're, they're, I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, my soul, if they only knew how people live in this world, 
And here you got basically a mansion. Okay, it needs a new coat of paint or maybe, you know, a new refrigerator or whatever in there. But, but goodness, we need to do some fasting, some voluntary poverty that moves us to thank God for his grace, for his gifts of food, clothing, and shelter. And while we're fasting, number four, is think about work. Think about your job. Probably times when you said, I hate my job. Actually, a good time to think about that is on the Sabbath, the day of rest. It's a great time to think about your job. Look on down to chapter 58 and verse 13. If you would turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourselves in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now again, I'm not going to get into the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday and the Christian Sabbath on Sunday because I know we got a lot of Seventh-day Adventists that watch the program, so I'm not wanting to get in that debate. That's another Wednesday night for another time. What I'm saying, though, is one day in seven, you need to fast from work. You need to take a day off, and you need to reflect upon your relationship with the Lord and also thank God for the fact that he's given you a job if you have one. I mean, while you're sitting there idle, thinking about dust and ashes, imagine you're that beggar at the bottom of the food chain out there holding up the sign that says, we'll work for food. Suppose you didn't have the health to work. Suppose there were no jobs. That day may be upon us quicker than you think if you look at our national debt of over $30 trillion right now. Sooner or later, that debt's going to come due. I know I'm not an economist nor the son of an economist. I just know you can't continue to stack debt on and on and on without somebody having to pay the freight on that. Learn not to complain about problems, the hard days, the difficult customers. Instead, be thankful for your job because, you know what, if your job was easy, it wouldn't need you. That's why they, tell, that's why they call it work, is because it's a job that they need done, and they've chosen you to do it. Number five, while you're fasting, reflect a little bit on history. In our case, United States history. In Israel's case, here in Isaiah, uh, that's what Isaiah's doing. He's reviewing a little Israelite history for him. In chapter 1, Isaiah 1 says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. He said, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know me, my people do not consider. God had blessed Israel more than any other nation on earth, and Israel had forgotten God and were taking their blessings for granted, and they had forgotten the Lord was their fount of every blessing. You know, America, too, is a nation that God has blessed more than any other in history, and we have forgotten God. Amen. In Romans chapter 1, we're told that forgetfulness is the first step toward ingratitude and toward unthankfulness. And then it starts describing that slippery slope all the way down to a reprobate lifestyle. And that's where we're headed as a nation. We need to open our Bibles. We need to study a little history while we're fasting and remind of how well God has blessed this country in the past. Also be reminded of what happens to nations who forget their God. Isaiah picks it up again. Isaiah chapter 3 spells it out for us. He said the first step in judgment, the first way you know that you're fixing to be judged by God, he, listen to what the Lord says. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, he's going to take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. And this time it won't be voluntary fasting. You'll be fasting because there's nothing to be had. He's going to take away the mighty man and the man of war. I think about that often in our own country. Where are the Eisenhowers? Where are the Pattons? Where are the MacArthur's anymore? You watch the way things went down as we left Afghanistan, you wonder, do we have any mighty military men left anymore? Well, that, that's, that's a sign that our nation is coming under judgment. He goes on. The judge, the prophet, the diviner, the elder, the Lord takes all those away. The Lord takes away the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the skillful artisan, the expert enchanter, 
And he says, what I'll do is I'll take away all of these great leaders and I will give them children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. The people will be oppressed, everyone by another, everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the worthless man toward the honorable. And I don't know about y'all, but that sounds like the White House right now. We've got immature leadership up there. And so that can only mean one thing. We're already under phase one of the judgment of God. Number six, while you're fasting. Who knew you had so many things to do while you were fasting, right? While you're fasting, remember salvation. How often do we thank God for our salvation? While we're fasting and becoming physically poor, also think spiritually poor. Remember what it's like to be lost. Some who were saved as adults can remember what it was like to be lost. Some of us, like myself, who were saved as a child cannot personally relate to that because I believed in Jesus Christ so early that I don't remember what it was like to be lost. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 tells us it's, you're in a position where you're without Christ, you're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and you have no hope, and you're without God in this world. That's what it means to be lost. The lost have no promise of heaven in the future. The lost have no confidence that God will hear their prayers. The lost have no blessed assurance that if they should die before they wake, whether or not the Lord their soul will take. Do you ever say the words of the children's chorus, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. That's something we can do while we're fasting. Beyond our salvation, do we ever thank God for the church? I've always attended church. I know many of you have as well, but if we're not careful, it becomes an unconscious habit, a hollow ritual. That's what the Lord is complaining about in Isaiah chapter 58. He said, y'all wear out my carpet. You come, <laughs> you come into my temple. Your mind's not on it. You come in here because you know you're supposed to. You come in here out of habit, but you really don't come in here to worship me and how easy that can happen to us. If we're not careful, it becomes that way. We need to go visit one of our shut-ins. Always breaks my heart when I go visit the shut-in and they tell me with tears in their eyes that they'd give anything to be able to be active and be able to come back to church again. But that's another one of those things where we don't realize it. We don't appreciate church till you can't go. We don't appreciate a peaceful church until you're part of a troubled church. And we don't appreciate a growing church until you're part of a dead church. Amen? That's just the way we are. These are the reasons we need fasting so we don't get so caught up in the now, so bound up in our own selfish little world that we never look back to compare our present with what's happened in the past. We never look up and say, thank you, Lord, for taking care of me. And we never look around and share our blessings with those who are struggling right now. I think we need to fast to voluntarily become poor for a day and break the bonds of every day and force ourselves to look up and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, you heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How many of you recognize the doxology? But that can become, I've been in churches before where that was the ritual. Every time you brought the offering plates forward, everybody stood up, praise God, I'm in my blessings. And I said, boy, they sound like they mean it out there. But, but how, how easy that happens. We fall into these rituals. One more thing about fasting and I've learned this one from experience. If all you do is fast, all you'll think about is food. You got to fast for a purpose. You got to have your mind off of food. You're not going to sit here and say, boy, I'm fixing to starve for 24 hours, but it's going to be great. I'm going to feel good when it's over. No, you got, you got to fast with a purpose. Fast from food and meditate on the Word of God, and you'll not notice your stomach being so empty. Say, I really want to study through the gospel of John or I want to look up a certain topic and get me a concordance and go through and read every passage of scripture in the Bible I can about this particular thing um, I guess one of the best biblical examples of that um, is watching the prophet Daniel 
In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, it says, In the first year of Darius, uh, Darius's reign, I, Daniel, understood the book, the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. In other words, he said, I read in Jeremiah, we're not going to go back home from Babylon soon. We're going to be over here 70 years, so we've got to figure out how to survive in this thing. And it said the way he picked up on that is he just sat down, opened up Jeremiah. He said, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make my request by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So do you see that? Can you picture that? You got Daniel the prophet praying, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. His Bible opened to the book of Jeremiah. And what happened? God revealed himself to Daniel. That's what fasting is for. That's when you get up close, close personal relationship with the Lord. If all you did is sit for 24 hours starving so that you could tell somebody that you sat for 24 hours starving, then that's not the purpose of fasting. Fasting is sitting there saying, I saw the Lord today. I took my eyes off of the world, and made the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I got to know a little bit more about the Lord today because I spent some time with him. It's about time to close. In closing, um, I was asked by one of our online attendees to do this and also to declare a national day of prayer and fasting. And I couldn't help but smile. I think somebody thinks that Danny has a whole lot more spiritual authority than I do. I'm pretty sure I do not have the spiritual horsepower to call a national day of prayer. But I will do this one thing. Uh, I'll ask everybody who's listening to me in person and also online uh, to pick a time out of the week to practice this biblical, this spiritual discipline called fasting. And again, you don't have to go crazy about it. You don't have to go climb on a 60-foot rock. It's only three feet wide and and sit out there and starve for months at a time. I'm just talking about miss a meal. Miss a meal once in a while. Open your Bibles and sit there and pray and say, Lord, I want to know you more. If you'll do that, I don't know if it's going to change America, but I do know this. It'll change some Christians. Amen. It'll make us more in league with what uh, God's got planned uh, for this world. So I ask you to do that. Miss a meal. Open your Bible. Seek the Lord in prayer. Intercede for yourself for your family, for your church, for your pastor, for your state, for your nation, to the uttermost part of the earth. To quote Isaiah, we are a nation that has forgotten God and judgment is coming. So we need to intercede for those around us and for ourselves that when the Lord does come in judgment that we are prepared to meet him. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you even for this difficult topic because as we study it, it tends to go from extremes rather than just taking some time off for our worldly affairs in order to spend some time getting to know you. We often end up trying to turn it into some kind of competition. Lord, forgive us for our pride and egos. We just want to know you more. Or we realize even though it seems though most of the world don't realize that our country is in a desperate state right now. And so, Lord, we pray that the people under the sound of my voice, both here and in person and those online, will seek you to know you and to know what you're up to in this world and for us to be faithful until you call us home. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.